Well, good morning. And you are here. And it is brisk outside. Beautiful, beautiful winter weekend with some sunshine. I just want to welcome those of you worshiping with us from our other campuses. I'm just so uh, pleased that we get to spend this time together. So uh, whether you've been around Ada Bible Church for years or whether this is your very first time in the building, whatever brought you here, wherever you're from, I'm just so pleased that we get this time together today. In the second installment of this uh, winter series called Making Sense Out of Life from the Old Testament book, of Ecclesiastes. And so uh, let me begin with a question. And uh, the question is, uh, do you recall the last time that you moved? As in everything goes into boxes, all of the boxes out to a moving van or moving truck or perhaps just the trunk of your car. And then you get to the new place and everything comes out of the boxes. Do you remember the last time? Remember the last time that you moved? All right, do you remember the last time you helped somebody move? Now that's love. <laughs> Particularly if it involved this endless stream, this endless parade of furniture and boxes and stuff out of the house, out to the curb, out of the house, out to the curb, out of the house, out to the curb. Uh, two months ago was the last time I offered to help someone move. My younger son, Alex, his family, they were moving. Simple move, uh, one part of Grand Rapids to another part of Grand Rapids, so just a couple miles. So I had the day off and still uh, uh, hoping for a nomination for Father of the Year. I called and said, hey, man, I'm free that day. Can I help? He says, yeah, no, Dad. We think we got the bases covered. But you can bring lunch, which was wonderful. So I turned into the, uh, the Jimmy John's delivery boy. I got the sandwiches for the moving crew and delivered them freaky fast. And also, also got to serve as staff photographer for the day. And he did. I got there to, to the place. They're unloading the truck. And he did have uh, everything uh, covered. This was the crew that was uh, with him that day. In that picture, you'd find my son and my uh, daughter-in-law. He is his brother. My other son's in the picture. My son-in-law, his brother-in-law is in the picture. A couple people from church. And then uh, some people that they had worked with like back in the day. And then you move on to a different employment. But the relationships had stayed intact. I don't know what you see when you look at that picture. But I look at that picture and I go, my kids are rich. <laughs> not because of the stuff they pulled out of the moving truck. And not because they moved into an opulent home. They're relationally rich. They're rich in friendship. Uh, the people gathered with them in front of the moving truck, it's not like a, a loose connection of people they barely know that they somehow roped into helping them move. Uh, they're with uh, long-term friends in what I would call deepening relationship. What, what I love when I look at that picture on my phone is it demonstrates that my kids are not doing life alone. They're doing life together. Now, what I want to do is I want to expose you to a statement that was written, I think, maybe 900 years or 1,000 years before the time of Jesus. It's just five words, and the statement is this, two are better than one. All right, can you read that out loud with me? Ready? Two are better than than one. This, my friends, is a verse in the Bible, Ecclesiastes, the Old Testament of the Bible, on living life together, doing life together. And Ecclesiastes, many people believe that this was written by like King Solomon, wise King Solomon of Israel. Two are better than one. Now, that two are better than one thing forms a kind of a hinge. On one side of two are better than one, there is a portrait of living life alone, and it's a tragic picture. And then you get the two are better than one verse. And then on the other side of the two are better than one is a portrait of life together. And so first there's a portrait of relational, relational poverty. And then the other side is a picture of relational wealth, relational riches, doing life together. Now, we're gonna absorb this section today, and as we absorb it together, as we absorb it together, I would love for you to renew your resolve to investing more deeply 
into the lives of a handful of other people. As we walk through this section of scripture from Ecclesiastes chapter four, I would love for you to go 2019, we're near the beginning of 2019. This is the year where I will step forward in attempting to identify and invest deeply in encouraging and enriching, in some cases comforting, a handful of other people. Now, the conversation we're gonna have today, I think it's an important conversation for any culture at any time. I mean, apparently it was needed a thousand years before the time of Jesus. But I believe that there are some cultural elements that we happen to be swimming in that make this deal about deepening relationship significantly more important. Not to overstate, but more important than ever. Can any of you identify what a couple of those cultural elements might be which make a conversation about deep relationships even more significant than at any other time? Anybody? This is a phone. This phone allows me to have the knowledge of the precise activity of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other people. I want to suggest to you that there is a social reality today that it is possible to be connected superficially to everybody and to be connected deeply to nobody. There is the possibility today to have a shallow relationship with everyone and a deepening relationship with no one. And it is possible that we have the most connected and simultaneously least connected culture in memorable history. And so I just, listen, may our gracious God work powerfully in our hearts as we explore this passage of scripture together. May he awaken us to the power and the strength of life together. May we all walk out of this room with a renewed resolve to offer time, to offer company, to offer encouragement to a handful of other people, a deepening relationship with a handful of other people. So the section story today unfolds in two parts. Portrait number one, life alone. Portrait number two, life uh, together with this two or better than one kind of is the hinge point right in, in the middle. So conversation number one, portrait number one, life alone. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse eight, we find this. There was a man all all alone, no friend group, no deepening relationships. There was a man all alone. And then it says he had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. That deal about no, uh, he had neither son nor brother, your son or your brother, those would be the two most logical places for your inheritance to go when you die. If you're working, 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 and you build this estate, and you got to hand it off to somebody, well, they go to your son, or you don't have a son, it would go to your brother. When it says, he had neither son nor brother, means some distant relative is going to get all of his stuff, and there's a lot of stuff. It says here, there's no end to his toil, and his eyes were not content with his wealth. Well, why is there no end to his toil? There's no end to his toil because this dude is chasing something that he is never going to catch. Just grasp this with me. If my goal is more, more doesn't really have a finish line because once I've got more, now all I need is more. After more, there's just more. And so it says there's no end to his toil. His eyes are not content with his wealth. This dude is chasing something. He is never going to catch. Now, what we have in Ecclesiastes 4.8 is a portrait of a guy who is very successful and very alone. 
we have a portrait of a guy who seems to be financially set and relationally bankrupt. See, what this guy in the portrait of life alone, what he doesn't have is that. He has this, undoubtedly, a table, but what he doesn't have is this, people around the table. He's financially set and he's relationally poverty stricken, very successful and very much alone. And you go, why? Why would you live like that? You need to know something. If that's the question that occurs to you, why do you live like that? That's the question the guy in the portrait has. There's this moment where we're invited into his brain, into his mind at this, at this moment where he starts to ask some critical questions in life. He, basically, where's my stuff gonna go? And why am, I not, why am I not even enjoying my life right now? Second half of verse eight, he says this, for whom am I toiling? Because sometimes when we're working our tails off, we're working really hard, we go, <clears throat> I'm doing it for my, I'm doing it for my family. He can't say that. He has neither son nor brother. He's all alone. He's not doing it. And sometimes when we say, I'm doing it for my family, sometimes that's true. (laughs) Sometimes that's not true, all right? You go, well, at least you're enjoying your stuff. He says, yeah, that's the problem. I'm not. And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? Work, 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 work. And he goes, this too is meaningless, a miserable business. This is crazy. You follow a guy at home from work. He's the first guy in the office, last guy to leave. Day after day after day, year after year after year. He gets home to an empty house. He heats up some leftovers in the microwave and he has dinner standing at the island in his kitchen. Garbage can is full, he lifts up the garbage bag, carries it out, flips on the garage light. And as he's opening up the canister to drop the garbage bag in, he looks over at a convertible. He goes, when was the last time I had that thing out just to enjoy the sky and just to enjoy the trees and just to enjoy the breeze. When is the last time I took a drive in the country just to enjoy myself? Then he goes, did I even take that out last summer? On the other side of the convertible, there's some very nice golf clubs. He goes, when's the last time I golfed for fun? When's the last time I went out for a round of golf and it wasn't an 18-hole business meeting? When's the last time I went out and enjoyed the company of a friend that wasn't an 18-hole sales pitch? And he goes, and I am working my tail off. This is crazy. And he's not getting any younger. This is crazy. That's the synopsis of portrait number one. This is meaningless, a miserable business. Now, as we read portrait number one, some of you found yourself in that story. Many of you didn't. Uh, Why would we do that? Pour so much time into work that relationships get pushed out to the margin. Not everybody, but a bunch of us, man, we like work. We really like to work. And if we're achieving and begin to taste some success in work. It's rewarding, financially rewarding particularly. There's this, man, if I worked hard last year and I reached certain excellence and achievement, if I work really hard this year, it could lead to more achievement. And next year, if I work really, really, really hard, it would lead even to greater achievements. And suddenly we're pulled into something that we truly enjoy, and yet it starts to push meaningful relationships to the outside. This guy is relationally poor because he happens to be preoccupied with work and wealth management. Some of you are looking at the guy and say, oh, dude, that is so not me. That is so not me. I am so not work 80 hours a week, climb the corporate ladder, buy the bigger house. I am so not a workaholic materialist. You're not out of the woods yet. This disease has several different strains. This guy is relationally poor because he was preoccupied with work and growing wealth. It is possible to become relationally poor 
not because we're working massive number of hours and losing our relationships. Is it possible to become relationally poor? Because we are preoccupied with something entirely different. It's possible to become relationally poor because we are totally preoccupied with our next experience, our next trip, our next adventure, our next foodie mecca, our next Instagram-worthy moment, and we're missing critical and core relationships in our life because we're loosely connected to all these adventures and we're not deeply connected to a group of people that we're, that we're journeying with, that we're traveling with, that we're pouring our life into as they're pouring our life. So what I'm saying is we can be preoccupied with any number of things and become relationally poor Netflix. I'm just dialing numbers. If your phone rings, answer it. We could spend so much time watching other people live their lives. We kind of forgot to live ours. We can become more deeply connected to the characters on a screen in series after series after series than we are to the real people in our world whose lives we could enrich. It doesn't have to be preoccupation with work. It can be preoccupation with our next experience. It can be preoccupation with a television screen. It can be a preoccupation with not getting hurt again. And man, if somewhere in your background is deep pain, from being abandoned, betrayed, or deserted. There is a self-defensive mechanism that can kick in where you go, never again. I'm never going to put myself in that position again where I get hurt like that. And we become preoccupied with not getting hurt. And unfortunately, in that preoccupation, we miss out on the opportunity to encourage and to enrich and to comfort, and to love, and to connect deeply with other people. All I'm saying here is that there are a number of strains of this virus, and it is possible to miss out on investing deeply in other people's lives because we're preoccupied with any number of things. Now, that portrait we looked at, it is crafted It is poetically crafted in order to generate an emotional response in the listener or in the reader. There was a man. There was this man I saw. He was all alone. No son, no brother, no end to his work. His eyes never content with his wealth. And he wakes up one day and goes, this is crazy. Who am I doing this for? Because it's obviously not my family. And why am I not at least enjoying life? This is meaningless, a miserable business. And the emotional response from this crafted portrait, we're supposed to look at it and go, there's got to be a better way to live. We're supposed to look at this portrait and go, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that guy that is successful at whatever and lonely. I don't want to be that guy. There's got to be a better way to live. And this is where the writer steps in and says, ah, ah, there is. That's a portrait of life alone. I want to present a second portrait, and it is a new portrait. It is a portrait of life together. Portrait number two, life together. And the very next verse is that that two are better than one verse. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Two are better than one. Conserve your energy. (laughs) Two are better than one. You go, yeah, dude, I don't think so. Thank you, Jeff, but uh, it might not have occurred to you that people can be wildly annoying. (laughs) They can be impatient. I mean, people can be strange. I mean, just look around. <laughs> and so the writer goes, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, let, me, uh, let me riff on this for a minute. This two are better than one thing. 
Let me try to convince you. And so what, what is pitched here is a road trip. Now, uh, we have to do something in order to grasp this. We have to leave our culture and go back to their culture because our culture is an automobile culture. You drive places. Their culture, most of the time they were walking. And it, how far to the next village? At four miles, six miles, 13 miles. And uh, you, you listen, there's a lot of life that we try to predict and control and, and manage and plan. And then there's just stuff that you don't see coming. And it's, it's uncertain. It's unpredictable. And quite frankly, many aspects like we don't know what's around the next corner. And so what the writer does next, he says, okay, let me pitch to you three travel hazards where if you hit one of these travel hazards, it's better off if there's two of you and if just one of you, it's gonna go, it's gonna go really rough. So three travel hazards to enforce this two are better than one thing. Travel hazard number one has to do with falling, with falling. Uh, verse 10, travel hazard number one, if either of them, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Now, again, this is not slipping on your sidewalk in front of your house. This is like 10 miles between villages. You sprain an ankle. No, you break an ankle. You're hobbling now. You're not going to make it to the next village before nightfall. Wolves come out at night. Bad people come out at night. You're just like, dude, I don't think I would do that. Here we, here, here's, what the, here's what the writer's saying. Don't travel alone. You never know when you're gonna do a face plant. So I, gotta, I, just, I just stop right here before hazard number two. I just gotta ask the question, who are you traveling with? Could you take a pen? Could you write down the names of five, seven, 10 other people where you say, no, 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 we're traveling together. If any of them took a fall, I think we'd be there to help them get back on their feet. If I did a face plant, I suspect that they would be there for me to help me get back on my feet. Who are you traveling with? Don't travel alone. Who are you traveling with? Life is unsure, it is uncertain, and there are aspects of it that are wildly unpredictable. Road hazard number one is you, you take a fall. Road hazard number two, you get caught in the cold. There, there's no radar, weather radar, cold front moving in. You're on this trip 12 miles to the next town. Icy rain sets in. Suddenly, you're not gonna make it there before nightfall. You're huddled by the side of the road. The temperature drops, the temperature drops, the temperature, first you're shivering, then you're hypothermic. Second road hazard, you get caught in the cold. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? This, my dear friends, is a Bible verse about spooning. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> you're out, temperature drops, temperature drops, temperature drops. Listen, man, at least you've got body warmth if you're with another person. Road hazard number two. Road hazard, road hazard number three, you get jumped. You get mugged. You come around a corner, there's some thugs there. They're gonna beat you up and take your stuff. So road hazard number three, though one may be what? One may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. This is about coming under... Uh, physical attack. Again, we try to predict life, we try to control life, we try to plan. You're never quite certain what's around the next corner. You come around a corner, three or four thugs there keeping an eye out for singular travelers. They look at you, look at your traveling companion, kind of go, yeah, we'll wait, we'll wait. And if there's two of you, it's like you got a fighting chance. All alone? Good luck with that one. And the writer is just building on this two is better than one thing. He says, listen, don't travel alone. Something about those three hazards of the road. You fall, you get caught in the cold, you come under attack. These are wildly unpredictable. You don't see these 
coming. Travel with someone because somewhere along the way, strong possibility that one of you is going to need the others. Here we go. Most important statement of today, I think. The relationships we build when nothing is going wrong sustain us when everything is going wrong. Those people that we invest in when nothing much is going wrong help us stay strong and afloat when everything is going wrong. Because life is unpredictable, uncertain, unsure, and we never can really see what's around the next corner. The car comes out of nowhere. And now there's the accident and the lengthy recovery, both physically and emotionally. The depression comes out of nowhere. This job change, you didn't see this coming. Suddenly, an entire department in your organization evaporates, and it was your department. You didn't see this coming. The the second miscarriage, the broken engagement that you didn't see coming. Child number one and child number two becomes evident when number two is two, two and a half years old, that there are going to be some uh, developmental challenges. You don't know what kindergarten is going to look like. You do know that parenting and loving and guiding child number two is going to be a different experience than loving and nurturing child number one. And you didn't see this coming. The lump that leads first to surgery and then to a treatment protocol. Life is uncertain and it is unsure. It is wildly unpredictable. We can't always see around the next corner. It's like, listen, don't travel Alone, those that you are journeying with, guarantee one of you is going to go through something big that disorients, that disrupts just all this upheaval, and you are already in a position to love and serve each other because, because of the mileage because of the mileage, the friendships we build when nothing is going wrong sustain us when everything is going wrong. And now the writer takes this two or better than one thing, and rather than an abstraction, gives us a concrete image, something that lodges in the mind. And the, the, the image that the writer uses is uh, it's rope that is made of several strands of string woven together. And so the writer ends this two are better than one, moving from me to we, life together, travel together conversation with this last image. It's like a, a chord of, let me get a numeric here, a chord of, three strands, is not easily broken. He's like saying, listen, alone, you are string. Together, you are rope. Alone, I am string. Together, we are rope. When you get slammed by an aspect of life, the chances that it will break you diminish if your life is bound together in meaningful relationships with other people. Alone, I am string. Together, we are rope. That would be worth saying together. Alone, I am string. Ready? Alone, I am string. Uh, Together, we are rope. Ready? Together, we are rope. Let's say it together. Ready? Alone, I am string. Together, 
we are rope. Now that's just good human advice. It's just good human advice uh, for anyone living in any culture at any, at any time. Just good human advice. And this is written, I think, maybe like 900 years, 1,000 years before the time of Jesus. It's good human advice, but with the coming of Jesus, with the coming of Jesus, with the cross of Jesus, and with the community of Jesus, this whole idea of two are better than one rockets in significance. It rockets in importance with the coming of Jesus, the cross of Jesus, and the community of Jesus. And so if you in any way claim to be a follower of the Christ, it takes this whole life together thing and adds fuel to it that's unbelievable and motivation to it that's unbelievable, the coming the cross in the community of Jesus. So I wanna show you something Jesus said. So we're gonna leave Ecclesiastes. We're gonna fast forward the tape like 900 years to the time of Jesus. This is a statement that Jesus said to his disciples. Many of you have seen this statement before. I think some of the energy behind the statement is not just what Jesus said, but when he said it. So uh, John chapter 13, verse 34 Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Any of you seen that? Seen that before at one time? Okay, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another, the words of Jesus. The when, when did he say that? John chapter 13? It's the Last Supper. Jesus will be suspended from a cross within hours of looking in the faces of his disciples and saying, I'm leaving. Now love one another as I have loved you. It occurs to me that Jesus' strategy for growing and comforting and encouraging his kids was through his other kids. Love one another as I have loved you. And he was about to show the extent of his love the next day. So you must love one another. Jesus' strategy for comforting and caring and encouraging and growing his children was through his other children. This is why this two are better than one thing. It just gets whole new importance, whole new significance if you are part of the Jesus community. Now, Jesus' crucifixion, then his resurrection, and then these Jesus groups start to spring up around the Roman Empire, and they needed encouragement on this new thing that they had become part of and how to behave in this new spiritual family. And so in the letters written to these new Jesus communities, you have these uh, encouragements given to how they're supposed to relate in this new in this new family, in this new community. And you'd find statements like this, love each other, serve each other, carry each other's burdens, build each other up, confess your crimes to one another. And my goodness, pray, pray for each other. Now, as you look at that list there, it is possible to do many of those with a total stranger. It is possible to serve a total stranger. Random act of kindness type thing. Mom, three little kids, pushing a shopping cart through the snow to a minivan. May I push your cart for you? Thank you. It's total stranger, serve each other, random act of kindness thing. That's awesome. Uh, down here, pray for each other. It's possible to pray for people you don't even know. You just hear about a situation. You say, God, please, please, God, just please meet them, shelter them, provide for them in this deal. It's, it's possible to do this with strangers, right? I want to suggest that this really gets legs, this really gets power when it's not between strangers, but it's between people you've been journeying with. You've got mileage with them. Serve each other because you know where and how to serve them. Carry their burdens because you have a clue being involved in their life what some of their burdens are. You put yourself in a position to hear a confession. Dude, I so messed up last week. 
and I am embarrassed, and I'm shaming out, and I just got to tell somebody what happened. Yes, it is a mess. I will pray for you. I commit that I will be praying this next week for God's mercy and for God's grace and for God's wisdom in how to move as we move forward. You can do this as, as strangers, but I think the real power of this is when you know somebody's temperament, you know where they live, you know where they work, you know single, married, kid situation, maybe their background, it puts you in a special place to be able to step in and to know what to offer when you have, when you have mileage to give. Now, the reason it's such a big deal for us is because Jesus says to his community, love one another. And Ada Bible Church isn't a little church. So if we just went, okay, everybody look out for everybody. Some of you are going like, that, I find that logistically challenging. <laughs> that is logistically challenging. Uh, in a church that's not a small church, saying everybody look out for everybody, totally unrealistic. However, let me tell you what is totally realistic. Everybody look out for somebody. Now that is doable. Everybody's looking out for somebody. It's one of the reasons years ago we implemented a small group structure so that if people come into a room with a, a bunch of people that they don't know all their names, we try to form people in you know, six, eight, 12 individuals that know each other's names, that know each other's stories, who are committed for a season of time for journeying, journeying together, traveling together, and a small group forms one of those networks where you go, listen, baby, I'm not responsible for everybody, but for the next stretch, we're looking out for her, we're looking out for him, we're looking out for them, we're looking out for him, and you can literally write the names down. I make it my mission to encourage and to serve and to listen and to pray for at least them. So I would ask again, who are you traveling with? What if this is the year where you say, I renew my resolve to investing deeply in a handful of other people. Don't travel alone. Last story today, I wanna, I wanna resurrect an incident, a story that we talked about uh, a couple of years ago. It applies incredibly to our conversation today. And the story we told a couple years ago had to do with a guy by the name of Aaron Ralston. Any of you recognize the name? Aaron Ralston? Okay, if you don't recognize the name, when I show you his picture, the story might come flooding back to you. Uh, this right here is Aaron Ralston. And if you see his forearm and hand, you'll see that he has a prosthetic, a prosthetic forearm and a prosthetic hand. And uh, Aaron Ralston wrote this book, which was called Between a Rock and a Hard Place. Is it ringing a bell now for any of you? After writing the book, uh, Between a Rock and a Hard Place, later the movie, 127 Hours came out about an incident that occurred to Aaron Ralston. What happened to Aaron Ralston was this. He was hiking alone in Canyonlands National Park in Utah, 2003. He's walking through this slot, wall on each side, when a, an 800-pound rock dislodged and pinned his arm to the canyon wall. And there... He stood trapped for five days, slowly dying of dehydration. And as an act of complete desperation, he used the dull pocket knife from his multi-tool to amputate his own arm, which is a pretty macho story, all things considered. Any hiking story that ends with, and then I amputated my own arm, is a pretty good story to tell. But he did come out of the canyon missing a limb. Now, I became acquainted with the incident involving Aaron Ralston. Before the book came out, it was a 
thumb into this magazine, National Geographic Adventurer, and I landed on the story, and there was this statement that stopped me. And the statement was, there was no search party. No one was looking for him because nobody knew where he had gone. And that statement stopped me because I thought to myself, he was hiking alone and nobody knew where he was. He was hiking alone and nobody knew where he was. I just thought to myself, oh my goodness. How many times over the years have we heard stories from people that would just say, I ended up in that mess. I ended up in that situation. Dude, I was hiking alone and nobody knew where I was. Nobody knew the condition of my heart. Nobody knew what was going on. I was hiking alone and nobody knew where I was. One of the reasons we don't let others into our heart is because uh, we risk exposure. Risk exposure. Exposure can be a terrifying thing. In our heart of hearts, we kind of go, look, look, man, if you knew me, if you really knew me, you couldn't possibly want me If you knew me, you wouldn't want me. And the best of Christian community says, I know you. And I still want you. Let's travel together. As we we ask, for you to renew your resolve to invest more deeply in the lives of a handful of other people. This is gonna mean some changes. I, the last thing I wanna do is make this sound simple, and make this sound easy. Uh, it can mean separating yourself from your phone for significantly greater lengths of time. It could mean turning superficial relationships into deepening relationships. It could be spending less time away from the television. It could be reevaluating this deal about work and go, okay, how much, how much, how much time, how much energy? And have all my relationships evaporated? And that is a hard turn for some of us to make if we love to work. So I don't know all the things this could mean for you. I know one thing this should mean for you. It should mean that you take very seriously the strategy that Jesus set up for growing his kids. And you realize you subject yourself to that mission. I will make it my mission to travel with, to encourage, if need be, to comfort, to grow with, a handful of other people. This was Jesus' strategy for growing us 